All right, it's Thursday, and it's not at a couple of the I know I'm late. I'm very late today. Welcome back to Uncut History here on Readout Productions. And let's just pivot that camera. You know, I got this very high-tech camera that I... It's totally not just the webcam that's on our laptop that we use to create everything on this channel. That's that's totally not going to backfire on me one day. I'm, you know, I'm totally not going to wake up one morning and my CPU is just completely gone burr within the laptop. And then I got to buy another one. I I really hope that doesn't happen this summer. I, I got a lot of plans. I want to I want to edit a lot. And even the background's not being well. OK, it's a little bit better now. I am in the market to get a proper webcam. I'd like the webcam to be separate from the live from my live streams. When I look at StreamYards, I could then instead of looking at the webcam right above StreamYards, I can look at the webcam maybe in a separate direction like this. And then I can be I could reorientate the screen because I have this entire bookshelf, more like a bookcase that's over here that I'd love to use as the backdrop for some videos but there there's no real way to do it at the, this time uh when i've been doing live streams with uh, captain garrett over on the swords and starships channel for example uh not every wednesday but in frequent wednesdays we've been recapping uh fx's shogun series which we should be meeting back up next week to talk about episodes eight and nine anyways when i do live streams like that i'm not used to having multiple people on screen my eyes go completely crazy because one eye is going over here to look at Garrett's screen. My other eyes go into my own screen. I'm like, oh, maybe I should look up straight. But now I feel weird because now I'm looking, not looking at the hosts and their facial reactions. It's, it's a whole thing. So I'm going to try to get a webcam here soon. If anybody has any suggestions for a webcam that can be plugged into a computer via USB port, I'd be very happy. Also, give me one with a nice price tag probably wondering what am i rambling about somebody's just tuned in right now like what what is this guy talking about what where's the history well this is uncut history uh we go live and i rant that's the best way to describe it about sometimes historic related content more often than not, i just go down a rabbit hole and usually end up talking about twister or something it's, it's usually where it goes that's a but let's be fair if you're tuning in just at this point that's probably why you're here because you want to hear me ramble uh we do actually have a historical site we're going to talk about tonight i didn't want to label this strictly the preservation shout out because i have one site that's all i got <laughs> busy week here i would like to say i'm busy because of the channel that's not the case. Uh, work in college. Work in college. Taking up my time right now. It'll be like this through May. So if you ever wonder if there's a week where I slip up of not having a live stream or getting a video out on Saturday, that's why. That's why. I'd rather be here editing videos and telling you stories of our shared past. But, you know, they tell me I need the funny paper in order to be able to talk about the past on a large scale. I say those people are completely crazy because I am here right now talking to you. So we're going to talk about a historic site. I also have two rants for you tonight. I, I feel they're both related enough to history that they warrant being on readout productions, but I'm probably stretching it thin. One is about my issue with the mainstream press coverage of a movie that just recently premiered. And the other is how I feel that a certain form of entertainment is failing to learn the mistakes from their shared past. So we're going to talk about both and all that tonight. But first things first, thank you for tuning in. Again, Ghost of Howard's Right Arm. Thank you for all those who are going to tune in tonight here on YouTube and Rumble. Still haven't worked out what's going on with the hate book. I wish I could. All right, so let me go down here. Well, first, let me get the mouse to work. That would be nice. We're going to go down here. All right. We're going to share the screen. 
Yep. Share the screen. Oh, I guess I need to go find something to share. I don't have anything pulled up to share. That, yeah, that, that, that ain't good. Let, let's let's go over here. Let's type in. Oh, that's right. My bookmarks are over here. Man, I'm you can tell I'm I am very, very tired today. I am completely discombobulated. I just made up a word, I think. Discombobulated, not bocu. Ah, who knows? Who knows? Man, you know, when I started doing this, my you can't see this, but my bookmarks. It was far smaller. It was far easier to access notes for the live streams. Now, I what's what's while we're here again? I'm scrolling through my bookmarks for Uncut History. Uh, the oldest one is June of 2023. Uh, I think we were talking about. Oh uh, yeah, that was when the 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 Titanic sub thing happened. Been a while. All right. April 4th? No, I need April 14th. Where is it up, down, up, up, down, down? How about I just type it in? Because I know what we're talking about tonight. All right. Rick and Monica. All right. I got it all covered. I, 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 I'm sorting it out, I think. I like to think I'm sorting things out. Um, Disco discombobulated d i s c o m b u l a t e i don't know that's my dictionary that that's the inser dictionary on how to spell discombobulated let me move that light up everything's really dark tonight i don't know why it's very windy out you know, here in Western Pennsylvania, where we apparently are now Tornado Alley, because we always get 50 mile per hour wind gusts, I swear, almost on a daily basis. It wasn't like that growing up, but that's where we live now. Here we are. Here is what we're going to talk about tonight. <laughs> yeah. Man, very winded. We are going to talk about the childhood home of Medal of Honor recipient Eddie Rickenbacker. Uh, this came to my mind last night because on a drink with crazies comic shop Wednesdays, uh, where he talks about a variety of independent comics, novels, music, sometimes all types of cult pop culture like that. Uh, I ended up throwing my name in the hat to get a shout out. Yeah, he talked about my most recent video that came out, and he had mentioned how much he wants me to discuss Eddie Rickenbacker. That's one of his idols growing up. I'm going to be honest. I don't know too much about Eddie Rickenbacker. I'm aware of him being considered the ace of aces for pilots from the United States during the First World War. I am aware of that. I know he got the Medal of Honor for his involvement. I, before today, do not know much more about him. <laughs> I hear his name always talked about, but not much else. So I decided, ah, oh, why not? Let me go look him up, uh, see what I can find, if there's any museums, historic sites. And I have found one, and that is his childhood home in Columbus, Ohio. Now, a little bit about... Whoa. My, my mouse. That's weird. I just do now realize you can see my mouse. You can see my mouse. But I'm not on that screen right now. I'm actually back over in StreamYards. What happens if I hit solo set? Oh, mouse disappears. Man, I get really easily distracted when I'm tired. Eddie Rickenbacker. Uh, he was born in the 1890s. His family raised him in Columbus, Ohio. He had six siblings. And in the, I think it was like 1894, 95, they moved into this like very small house in Columbus that had no running water, had no electricity. Granted, this is at the very, very end of the 19th century. So that makes somewhat sense. But just to give you an idea, they were on the lower echelons of Columbus life. Uh, uh, Mr. Rickenbacker was highly accident prone. I read about how not once, but twice his brother had pulled him out of the way from a moving coal car. <laughs> to name a few other incident incidents in his childhood. Uh, but in any case, uh, he will go on and he had a big fascination with motors. Now, his fascination with motors kind of had to put on be put on the side because when he was just 12 years old, his father passed away and Rickenbacker was expected to be the breadwinner for the family. 
Uh, but in any case, he ended up working his way, some odd jobs, and eventually found his way into the automotive industry when it was in its infancy at the dawn of the 20th century. I mean, we're talking old school cars back then. Uh, this is when, you know, Fred Duesenberg is just coming on the rise, those type of mechanics. I don't even think Ford's really on the scene yet at this point. So uh, Rickenbacker initially was involved being um, a assistant for executives of automotive industries, eventually worked his way up to being involved with car racing. And that's where he got a lot of his early fame in the 1910s, uh, racing auto, uh, automobiles. Uh, he would compete multiple times in the uh, at Indianapolis Motor Speedway, but he never actually won first place in those races, at least from the sources I was reading. Well, at the time of the First World War, he chose to volunteer for service, which is interesting because he did not necessarily have to. He had a very good salary that if he wanted to stay and kind of be complete, uh, he had friends in high places to do that by the time he was a car racer. But in any case, he forego his uh, racing salary, volunteered because he wanted to be involved with the new, uh, the new air wing that was being developed for the Army. Remember, at this time, there was not a strict United States Air Force. There were Army wings uh, for the Army, for the Navy. The Marine Corps would get one. If you've watched their video about the Marine Corps maneuvers at Gettysburg in 1922, you'll get to learn all about that juicy, those juicy details. And we actually talked a bit about the infancy of American military aviation just in last week's Retracing History when we went and explored the 28th Infantry Division Shrine in the Pennsylvania Military Museum. But back to Eddie Rickenbacker. Uh, Rickenbacker had a fear of heights, but he had no problems. He wanted to get inside a plane because he was fascinated by how they can mechanize this, use a motor to propel something in the air. That fascinated him. So his, his love of motors put him in the cockpit of a plane during the First World War. Now, he would not typically have been allowed to enlist with the pilots in 1917 and 1918. To be a pilot back then, you had to be in your late teens, early 20s, and you had to come from a very high education. You had to come from like Harvard or Yale or something. You had to have influential people supporting you. He was 27 years old when he enlisted, so he was considered too old, and... OneDrive is reminding me that I have photographs from my last visit to Falling Water. Thank you for reminding me, OneDrive on Microsoft. Anyways, <laughs> I'm getting distracted tonight. Anyways, so he was too old typically to be enlisted into the air wing. In addition, he had no secondary education. He had no degree to his name. That was a big no-no when you were going to get enlisted into the air wing. But again... He had friends in high places because of his position as a famed automotive racer. So they were able to pull some strings behind the scenes. of like, no, you really want this guy. He knows his stuff about motors. Get him in. Yeah, the squirrels are popping out all over the place. So he's allowed into the air wing. Uh, initially didn't get along too well with his peers. But once people started realizing... Oh, he's not just here because he's famous. He actually knows how motors work, which is saying more than most of the people working on these planes at the time. So a lot of his co-pilots started warming up to him. And throughout his service, uh, he would log over 300 hours in combat. Uh, he had over 100 aerial encounters where he would have an occurrence with the enemy. And it depends on who you ask. He was he is he can claim anywhere from 24 to 26 kills during the First World War. That's a very high number, especially for American pilots. A, hence why he was known as the Ace of Aces. I uh, received France's highest honors. He received the American Medal of Honor, though he got that a few years after his service in the military. Interesting thing about Rickenbacker, though, he did not like being called the ace of aces. He, he was a very humble individual. He did not like any titles. The only title he really kept from the military, he was he was okay with people calling him captain because that was his rank in the military. But he did not want to be seen as some next level icon that was invincible. That was not his way of life. After the Great War, uh, he tried to invest his, uh, his, his income into starting his own automotive industry. That did not work out too well for him. 
Uh, he was competing with one too many people in the 1920s. He just kind of got lost in the mire. So in 1927, to recuperate some of his losses, he took a offer to become president of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, a position he would hold the whole way through the Second World War, believe it or not. Uh, he also was very influential in various automotive designs around this time period. He had his fingerprints were over a lot of different car designs that were released by multiple companies. And then the Second World War happened. And Mr. Rickenbacker, due to his fame from the First World War, was kind of sent around the uh, the Pacific theater of conflict, being toured around to promote. I guess it's kind of like the early days where we know today's USO kind of promoting morale in the military force. Like, you know, if I can do it, you can do it. So he went on these tours to various military bases. Well, during one of those tours, his B-17, he was flying in. Uh, the pilot uh, got lost over the South Pacific and they ran out of fuel and crashed. And Rickenbacker and a small group of survivors Survived 22 days adrift in the South Pacific. During the Second World War, I want to remind you. And they were fighting off like sharks and other, the, the elements. But they managed to survive and many credit his leadership as pulling the crew through surviving. So if it wasn't enough that he was called the Ace of Aces, now he has this heroic survival story attached to his name. And he would continue to be a key figure in the automotive and uh, airplane industries up until his death. So I went and researched that this guy that has a wild life story, but surely yes, have something attached to him. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, his house, his childhood home does remain standing in Columbus, Ohio. Now I did a little digging. The house itself was owned by the Rickenbacker family until the 1960s. But it's been a long road to get this into a museum. Uh, the Historian Ohio website says that in 2006, archaeological digs were actually conducted on the property that revealed very, not too much, but they ended up finding marbles, which actually supported Rickenbacker's story that he had fond memories of playing marbles in the backyard. So that's an interesting direct tie that they were able to excavate from Rickenbacker, showing you the, the cool stuff you can do with archaeology. But what they've been trying to do is they want to turn this into a museum and they want to call it the Rickenbacker Woods Science and History Museum. Now, I can't figure out if the, the gray house in the photograph is the house they're referring to. They say there's another structure on the Rickenbacker property or adjacent to it that's tied to another individual. And that individual is photographed right here, Grainville Woods. Mr. Woods was also a Columbus native. Uh, who ended up moving to Cincinnati, and he ended up moving up to New York, kind of moved around the uh, Mid-Atlantic region. Uh, he was a key inventor, uh, particularly in the electrical field in the late 19th and early 20th century. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Woods here is actually credited to developing over 45 different patents. Uh, just some, I do have a nice little list here because my brain won't remember. Some of the stuff he ended up developing, he developed what he called the tel... Uh, tel Tell, oh, I can't speak. There it is. What do we get? 25 minutes in the video. And I'm going off the rails. Telegraphy. He developed a form of communication known as telegraphy, which essentially was an evolution of the telegraph where you could combine telegraph messages and voice messages and transmit it on one wire. The caveat was it still came out in one Morse code. I don't know quite how that would transfer with the voice maybe how to read it through like a system and then the voice you you would you know how some of them dotted papers are when you run them through it'll start making very primitive noises maybe it'll something along that uh but his telegraphy revelation uh he eventually sold the patent to the american bell uh the american bell telephone company and that of course will lead to the evolution of the telephone as we know it today. Uh, he also found that he ended up developing a variant of inductors, which would allow communication between train stations and moving and moving trains. And of course the uh, inductors and electricity are very important today to allow wires to cross in with each other and without them all, you know, 
causing electrical sparks and burning a building down. So inductors, very important. This man is credited with developing them. Uh, you'll also have that his in the inductor system he developed, Thomas Edison twice claimed it, and twice Woods defeated Edison in court. <laughs> so this is the man that outsmarted Thomas Edison. And anybody who can one-up Thomas Edison is always a friend in my book. Thomas Edison gets way too much freaking credit. Very business savvy, Thomas Edison was. And that's why we remember him. But a lot of people made better innovations than him. <coughs> Nikola Tesla. <coughs> Sorry about that. There was a little spike coming out of me. But possibly his biggest contribution is a system to electrify uh, railways that did not need an overhang electrical wire. Rather, he developed what was known as the third electric rail. And this was especially important when the a big blizzard hit New York City back in the 1880s and kind of wiped out their electrical grids, their early infant electrical grids. Keep that in mind. You know, the DC powered ones. And they realized, okay, we can't have electrical lines being up in the air at all times to power these cars. Is there an alternate method? Mr. Woods found that alternate method. So Mr. Woods is very important to innovations in electricity and other technology that is credited to the United States of America. Unfortunately, he died in 1910. He was only in his early 50s. And he was kind of put in a potter's grave. There was no marker for him. It wasn't until the 1970s that uh, associate, uh, I guess you want to say relatives of Woods discovered where he was buried and basically petitioned all of the companies that profited from his patents. Like, you know, this man made all of your fortunes. Be nice to put a nice modest headstone over his grave at least. So that happened in the 1970s. So I can't fully figure out if it's his house or if there's a piece of property. It seems it is adjacent to Rickenbacker's childhood home. And as such, there have been people wanting to make a museum about, about both men since their properties in so close proximity to each other. This has been in developmental hell for the whole 21st century. I think it comes down to lack of funding from the city of Columbus, Ohio. Uh, the There is definitely volunteer interest, but able to build the proper infrastructure for it. So while these... Uh, the Rickenbacker home was stabilized. It has not been converted into a museum that the public can explore. However, the property is currently owned by the Rickenbacker Woods Associate uh, Organization. My apologies. And we're going to read, oh, foundation. Wow. Got that twice wrong. Let's read a little bit more about their, what they're all doing. The Rickenbacker Wood Foundation strives to ignite the spirit and innovation and perseverance embodied by the lives and legacies of Captain Eddie Rickenbacker and Gra Grainville T. Woods, providing youth access and opportunities to STEAM education while fostering the personal development of families in the community. Our campus serves as a resource for families in the community for the facilitation of programming that provides holistic opportunities for personal enrichment. Uh, so they're working right now. They you they do use Rickenbacker's property to host a variety of activities. They don't really do anything inside the building this time. Uh, one of the things they actually do at Rickenbacker's home is the market at Rickenbacker's Woods. It's an outdoor shopping experience located on the grounds of the home. Held Saturdays from May for September, each market features a variety of makers and vendors. And then you can actually see here on the map. We'll zoom out a little bit if you want to see where this estate is located. Right in the heart of Columbus, Ohio. Go down a little bit closer. And there you can see the Rickenbacker estate. They have this, they have this link for National Landmark Museum. And this is all I'm getting. I've tried to find more information about what they're doing to produce a museum. I cannot receive any information. So I would like... It would be nice if they had a bit more... When you go to the news, most of it is about their community outreaches, which I commend them for, but I, I would like to see a bit more about what they're trying to do to develop their museum. I think they have an education facility somewhere in Columbus, as that's where it appears a lot of these photographs, because you can actually see behind the, t the educator here, there's a definite image of, of Mr. Woods. So it seems that they have an education facility where they're able to host a variety of activities for the youth of Columbus, Ohio. So yeah, I'm going to drop a link in for 
we'll go back to the starting page for the Rickenbacker Woods uh, Foundation who are striving to preserve the childhood home of Medal of Honor recipient Eddie Rickenbacker and as well as tell the story about another Columbus native, uh, Mr. Woods here. So I'm going to drop the link in the description below. Should be appearing right about now on both the Tube View and the Rumble. There we are. Perfect. There they are. There they appear. All right. And thus, I guess, concludes the high academic portion of our evening. Now I get to rant. It's going to get to rant. It's going to be so excited. I'm going to get to rant. But before we continue, if you are tuning in right now, be sure to hit the like button down below. Uh, let the YouTube algorithm know that you do want to see history. You do want to enjoy me rambling on live streams. Uh, YouTube's not really friendly to having it to a channel that has both live streams and videos. It's one or the other. You can't have both. So be sure to hit the like button down below. Indeed, buckle your buckle your seatbelts. All right. So a few days ago, uh, Alex Garland's movie Civil War released. It's simply titled Civil War. Nope, it's not about it's not about that Civil War that we have the uh, Fire Zoo Office poster for behind me. Uh, it is a what if scenario about photojournalists kind of going through war-torn United States of America should an American Civil War occur in the 21st century in the near future. So that's the plot of the movie. The movie, I feel, is more designed to shock and awe the, the viewing audience into the age-old trope. War is bad! Good job for letting us know that. Although, considering every time people go to war... Maybe we have to keep having it hammered into us. It's it's like the SpongeBob meme. How many times are we going to teach this to you, old man? War bad. You won't learn. We had a whole conflict. We call it the Great War for many years because we thought it was the most unimaginable horror. How could us humans conceive it? It'll never happen again. Yeah, that didn't. That didn't. That they, we didn't really learn our lesson from that one. So. <laughs> So that's what the movie's more about. It's more about the shock and awe on what war would looks like in the 21st century, what it could look like in a country in a Western nation like the United States of America. We hear so often a term civil war used today to describe conflicts that are occurring in the Middle East, particularly Syria. Uh, was it was um, uh, Yemen? There, there's so many freaking countries that have had civil wars down in that area of the world lately. Syria is the one that comes to mind, especially because of how many different factions developed from that. And kind of gives you the idea of how messy a civil war is. What are we in? Like the ninth, tenth year of the Syrian civil war? Did I Was it Iraq or Iran that had a civil war there in like the 2010s? I think it was, I want to say it was, I want to say it was Iraq. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I need to do more research on uh, the war on Iraq and the war on terror. That, that's going to become a major subject for historical research in the near future. Keep that in mind. That's just not just me. That's just a fact we're, gonna, we're going to encounter here. Back to my story. So Civil War came out, and I haven't seen it. I'm probably not going to see it. It's not for me. I can't comment on the movie itself. But gosh darn, can I comment on how much I'm sick of the coverage about it and how the mainstream media has this naivete or also maybe it's even like an arrogance. Like this is never, you know, that, th huh, what if an American Civil War happened? What would that look like? Literally, that's like some of these people commenting. Now, I would like to believe that these are people that are simply being mis- um, being mistooken for what they're saying that obviously certain things are leave out in a conversation. It's like, Oh, okay. You know, they're not going to, they're not going to make aware of every single, you know, nuance and things that happen behind us. They're talking about the now, the present times, but in the past few years, I have lost all of my confidence in the press, in the mainstream media outlets and people that call themselves journalists. I have lost all, all respect for them. I have lost all confidence that they're telling the truth. So yeah, I do believe that these people are legit that naive and do not realize that between the years 1861 and 1865, there was a little thing called the American Civil War that happened. And I also find it hilarious. These people going, oh, how horrifying. A photojournalist documenting a civil war in America. 
Oh, I hope that never happens. Here it is right here. The photograph sketchbook of Alexander Garner in reprint to this day of what? The American Civil War. And look, we got images of the locations involved with the American Civil War. It's like people actually did this in the past. It makes for fascinating stories. We should be telling the stories of men like Alexander Gardner and Matthew Brady and Timothy O'Sullivan, these photo, these photojournalists that went into war zones and photographed this conflict, this American Civil War. There is a fountain of wealth here. We're actually, oh, interesting enough, I flipped to the Gettysburg section. Okay. Here, the most one of the most famous photos, and I'm probably going probably to get this whole stream deplatformed because I'm about to show it. Here it is in this horrible, lighty, blurry version, the harvest of death somewhere on the first day's battlefield at Gettysburg. You want more shock and horror of, of, of what a civil war in America would look like? Here, we got, not that one, not that one. Here, we got the photo of a home of a rebel sharpshooter. And you know what else, something too, that really irks me? That at least from what I'm hearing from the comments on the movie and how much it gives complete, complete, you know, I immunity to journalists. Like, well, they're just there doing their job, trying to report the truth. They are they don't want to bend anything. Well, here in this photograph, historians have proven that Alexander Garner's team moved the body into Devil's Den stage prop rifles, stage prop canteen and everything to make a story. That would not pass today. If some, if you learned that somebody had done that today, they would be completely decredited. They would not be allowed to call themselves a photojournalist anymore. But, you know, you never know. Maybe people get away. Maybe most of the photographs we see today, they're manipulating even to this day in 2024. So that's another thing I have a big issue hearing about from this movie that, yes, it puts the photojournalism such as their whole, you know, they could do nothing wrong in a civil war. They're just trying to tell the truth. Well, this is what Alexander Garner did. A photojournalist during the American Civil War did. He manipulated a scene to try to bend the emotions of people back home. By the way, it worked. I'm not even saying it was necessarily, a, you know, that, you know, it didn't have important consequences and it didn't help hammer home how awful this war was. But <laughs> I don't think we would call that as being a professional today if you would do that in 2024. So, yeah, the naivete, the ignorance of some of the mainstream media's coverage of, oh, what would a civil war look like? It's stuff like this. It makes me so upset because it's like, you know, historian's job, we try to tell you the things that happened in the past so you don't repeat it. There are many museums, many foundations and entities struggling to preserve just an acre of land where these historic events occurred. They use those as classrooms to educate about a civil war that occurred in the United States to tell you about this is what it looks like when war happens in our country. I know 160 years sounds long, it's really not. Remember, we still had we still had people collecting pensions from the American Civil War because they were daughters or were wives of some of these Civil War veterans. They, it was only what, like 3 years ago the last pension collector from the American Civil War passed away. It's not that far away, folks. It's not that far gone. These battles occurred in cities, in towns that still stand today. You can go to places like Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, Sharpsburg, Maryland, Fredericksburg, Virginia, even Atlanta, Georgia, even though it's very minuscule, you can go to these places and you will find damage from these battles. Why are these places located where they are today? Because a big battle occurred here. It's all there. The ruins, the destruction is still vestiges of it. Many people have argued that the United States never got over the American Civil War, that there's still a psychological damage that's passed through the generation and why there's so much conflict over the interpretation of what the war meant. Now, somebody brought up a very fair point today to me that, well, Civil wars typically are very messy. They have multiple sides and factions. The American Civil War tends to be the exception. That it's two governments 
two countries, two armies doing battle, often pitch, you know, out in a field fighting against each other. You know, it's very different, very, it's far more sanitized compared to the civil wars that we hear about today, like in Syria. And you know what? That is a valid point. But the thing is, when you dig deeper into the story of the American Civil War, the more and more gray it becomes. And the less there are going to be two equal factions, and the more you see some ugly atrocities committed that have no reason to have happened. No reason other than, well, it is war. In my personal opinion, the American Civil War, us teaching it as simply being occurring from 1861 to 65, is a grave misconception. The more I read, the more I realize the true violent acts of the American Civil War go back to 1854. They go to the Kansas and Nebraska Act, where they were going to allow popular sovereignty to decide if these states would be free or slave, which just basically was like telling all of these militant extreme factions that were ready to pull the knives out and already in isolate cases were murdering each other in the streets already to that point. Oh, you mean we can go over and wage our proxy war over here and the government's really not going to do much to stop us? Okay. And since 1854 until the start of the American Civil War, you had these border ruffians going from Missouri into Kansas and just murdering each other. It's some of the most brutal actions you'll ever read about in any history books, if they even acknowledge it. This is where John Brown arises from, why he decides to go full militant with trying to end slavery. You know, he ma he murders multiple people only because their political allegiance is with slavery. Not necessarily because they own slaves, but merely because they had a political association with that faction. Murdered them. Cold blood. Old Testament style. And of course, this is going to come back east in 1859 with the raid on Harper's Ferry. It's interesting to think about that, that there was this civil war happening out west and everybody back east kind of going, oh, nothing's going wrong. Nothing to see here. Everything's just fine, guys. Everything's just fine. Until John Brown went down to Harper's Ferry and basically shook the entire east coast by doing that. And then everybody up east freaked out. And that's when you're going to see all these militias being raised in southern states because they're fearful that further attempts are going to be made to incite an insurrection in their own borders. This is when you're going to see the rise of Lincoln on the Republican ticket, which is going to even more make these southern states even more fearful and, of course, leads to the 1860 election. That is going to lead to se several of these states seceding. And now we have the official declaration of the American Civil War. There's all this violence that's murky, dirty. Why are they doing this? This is not how you decide this before we even get to the official declaration of war. And then when the actual official governments are done fighting, when the Confederate States of America are dissolved, you got the era of Reconstruction, which so many classes overlook. They you'll often see these American history classes. They will either end with 1865. They'll start with the 1870s. They kind of, they jump over or gloss over the era of reconstruction. Reconstruction, in my opinion, was a failure. It did not go well. Now, Who's to say what would have happened if the Lincoln administration, as it was in 1864, carried into 1865, 66, except 68? There's many historians on a throw doubt that even Lincoln's administration was going to be able to reconstruct the, the South afterwards. So this, I'm saying what we were handed with, even in the ideal situations. I'm just not saying if only this happened. I think either way, reconstruction was going to be a mess because no war is clean. There are so many loose ends, but man, did the Johnson administration, later the Grant administration, man, did they mishandle trying to trying to mend the wounds of the South. There were efforts made to try to impose the new amendments. There were efforts made to try to like, hey guys, you know, you lost. It's time to come back into the union. This you have to. This this is the Constitution, the law of the land. Uphold this Constitution. You'll still have your other rights as a state, 
But instead, they usually kind of defaulted and like, oh, well, nobody's doing it. So um, we're not really going to do much to really stop all these loopholes being made to get around the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th Amendment. You know, there was a time where freaking Sherman, though I don't agree with him on this, he basically wanted everybody to, he basically wanted to claim all property from all these southern plantations and distributed to the north. He's like, no, 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 no. That's federal property now that we've confiscated from rebels. That ain't going back. He was furious when that, when basically they're, when the federal governments were basically allowing these plantation owners to move right back in. And you'll start going to see all these, you know, sharecropping be imposed. You're going to see all the stuff, the, um, the apprentice act, which basically was like, yeah, well, this, uh, young boy, you know, he was, um, I mean, once was a slave of of mine, but no longer he's a slave, but you know, he needs years of tutorage. So it's, it's best for us to take him in and have him on my property as farming. Cause his parents, they, they can't take care of him. They don't have the proper education. They themselves being slaves, of course. So they weren't good. All this bullshit that was allowed to happen is never talked about. In our history books, how messy Reconstruction was and how it failed in many aspects and how you had stuff like the Klan running rushshot, doing riots, burning settlements. There were fights happening. Riots were happening. In 1874, there was a whole drama that happened in Louisiana where you had the Battle of Liberty Place, where you had the light. Light League tried to overthrow the Louisiana state government because they weren't agreeing with the reconstruction policies they were trying to impose, which required federal forces to move in. It involved General James Longstreet, the same Longstreet fame from the Army North Virginia, leading forces to try to stop the White League. <laughs> it was so crazy. It like it, there were all these raids happening. I don't agree with them doing this, but you should keep in mind that Jesse James gang, they claim that they were fighting for old Dixie when they went up there raiding all these banks, going all the way north, going all the way to their famous, their famous, you know, failed bank heist up in Minnesota. But all these threads of the Civil War that were not tied after you know, Lee surrenders the army in North Virginia and Johnson surrenders the army of Tennessee. There's so many loose threads still. The American Civil War was a very messy civil war. It may look clean when you read about these key battles, key military and political figures. But once you look in the underbelly, you realize, oh, yeah, no, there's a lot of fact multi-factions of helping. Things are breaking down. Look, look at Jones County in Mississippi. What happened there? You had that whole county revolted against the Confederate States of America. Look at M Missouri. The whole Civil War in Missouri is a mess. That's where you get the inspiration for tales like the outlaw Josie Wells. Uh, a more accurate thing would be talking about the sacking of Lawrence, where basically all of these, uh, they, all these, all these, you know, I guess you want to say pro-Confederate factions, but they really weren't Confederate soldiers. Just stormed into Kansas, uh, Lawrence, Kansas, because it was a uh, was a pro-free state kind of pinnacle and Lawrence itself, Lawrence, Kansas, man, does it have a rough history of all these brutal, pro brutal, you know, you know, all, I don't know worse, the, the border ruffian action from the bleeding Kansas era going into then the American civil war with it continuing. None of these are really factions of the union or Confederates. It's just civilians going, well, I identify with us ide ideology. So I'm going to kill these people in the name of my ideology. And the government's going, wait, what the, what are you doing? Don't, don't do that. But governments do nothing really to stop them or incent de decentivize these actions. It, <sighs> So that's why I get so freaking annoyed when we got these freaking mainstream press outlets. They're the spoken word of the people. We say nothing wrong. We're telling the truth. What if a civil war happened in America? What would that look like, children? I wonder. Go watch this movie with all this gore and violence set in 21st century America. Oh, God, that would be so bad if... Thankfully, that never happened in America. Thankfully, that will never happen in our reality. Nah, that never happened. 
Americans kill each other over ideological differences? That never happened. That's just a what if that happens in the movies. That's my issue with the press coverage of Alex Gar Garland's Civil War, the movie released just a few days ago. The movie itself, I can't comment too much. doesn't seem to be my cup of tea. I'm just really, really angry at all this naivete. And at the same time, the same people that will go and try to talk. Some of these journalists will always try to act like they know history then. You know, that's where you get the infamous, uh, what was it, the 1619 Project, which, by the way, was not started as actually like an education system. As far as I'm aware, I don't think it was actually like a government proposed that as a as a curriculum on history. Rather, it was like a, it was one of the New York newspapers that issued that. Like, well, what if we did this? What if an editorial? Okay, what if we did this? I disagree with this because you're just swinging the pendulum the other way. Just like how the Trump administration tried to issue the 1776 curriculum. Yeah, not a fan of that because it's just trying to reinforce all the the current education system, which is, and it's the current historical education of public schools is already bad. It's already flawed. It has many pit holes, such as not talking about reconstruction too much. I don't think we have to trump it up, so to speak, <laughs> so to speak. So yeah, that's my grievance. That's my grievance with the press and its coverage of the movie Civil War, you know, who need who need it's like oh we're gonna see a movie about a photojournalist trying to document the civil war i read alexander garnell's photo ske photographic sketchbook man there is a lot to talk about when it comes to gardner his rivalry with matt well work a professional rivalry with matthew brady i don't know how i don't know how personal it was you probably know matthew brady's name everybody claims he photographed the civil war he kind of did. He was a photographer. He wasn't the only one. He's just as famous because he photographed all of these famous people before the American Civil War. His studio in New York was the one to go to. And he was a good self-promoter of himself. Uh, but unfortunately, he went bankrupt after the war was over. He thought he was going to sell his entire collection to the United States government of the Civil War. They didn't want it. They kind of saw it as trash, which is Wrong. That was important documentation. So he went bust as a result. Uh, then people have only really remembered him more in the 20th and 21st century. Ken Burns documentary made him famous using photographs that he that they attributed to Matthew Brady. So his name became synonymous. And he should be poorly remembered, but he wasn't the only one. One of his employees, Alexander Gardner, who was employed in Brady's studio, he went out and did a lot of field photography during the civil war 1861-62 for brady brady and Seif had very poor eyesight so he was not able to do a lot in the field himself he entrusted his other employees gardener photographed photogra photographs of battlefield dead at antietam in 1862 which revolutionized photojournalism but since it was done for brady's studio gardener didn't get the credit for it and gardener had some personal friendship with President Lincoln. So that'll help you out in the world. And in 1863, Gardner struck it out on his own, opened up his own studio in D.C. Gardner, I think, photographed Lincoln every single year during his administration. It's like the most complete set of, of documenting a president in the 19th century. So if you've seen a photograph of President Lincoln, chances are Gardner was behind the lens, even if it may be a credit to Brady. And Gardner had a Really prolific career during the Civil War. We just saw he photographed the Battle of Gettysburg, the aftermath of it. Uh, he followed the Army of the Potomac during the Overland Campaign, which, by the way, this is the 160th anniversary of 2024 is. Uh, and then after the war, he got employed by like the railroads. He went out west, photographed the construction of the railroads, a lot of cool images of the Rocky Mountains. He photographed native tribes which was one that he was one of the first people to get to do that. So a lot of our documentation, we photo documentation we have of what the native tribes looked like on the plains in the late 19th century. It comes from Gardner and his team. And yeah, he ended up becoming very successful, donating a lot of his money to philanthropy in later years. And not a lot of people know his name. And that pisses me off. <laughs> So yeah, maybe I'm just getting angry because I'm just a big Alexander fanboy, Alexander Gardner fanboy, and I just want his story to be told. Hey, guess who tuned in? We have Wrangler who tuned in to give us a 
four twenty. Thank you very much, Wrangler. I hope you're enjoying tonight. I hope you're enjoying me losing my mind and trying to get myself kicked off of YouTube. But I do what I do. All right. So I do have one other topic. It's going to be another rant. I don't think it's going to be as intense as that. In fact, we're not really going to be talking about historical subjects we usually deal with here on the channel. And why is my frame rate going down? Hello, camera. I am Spencer in a bit. Beep, bop, boop, bop, beep. So you may or may not know that at one time I was a fan of professional wrestling. I don't know why it's called professional wrestling since it's all stage. Uh, for a while, some people decided to call it sports entertainment, but that's like too vague. It's like, well, they, they're still trying to imitate the act of wrestling and of combat. So it's not just sport, you know, it's a particular type of sport they're mimicking. But in any ways, we call professional wrestling, whereas the Southerners worded wrestling. I think, I think we, R.H. Snow, um, the queen of the Iron Age. She has, she has a whole series of books about Texas and the post-apocalypse. Uh, I think she would coin the phrase wrestling. She would have WCCW where she was from, World Class Championship Wrestling. Okay. Any case, you can tell I actually am a very big professional wrestling fan. I'm, I'm throwing all these obscure references out. Uh, well, how did I get into professional wrestling? How does a historian start watching dudes and women staging violence and ridiculous manners? Well, I had to do a little bit of fact that growing up, I would always wonder what my father was watching after I went to bed at eight, eight or nine o'clock. When I, after my bedtime, like, well, why am I have to go to bed? Dad's down there at the couch. And mom's like, no, no, that's, that's, that's dad's time to watch TV. And I don't know when truly it was. It had to be in like the late 20, 2000s. I snuck down a few times. My dad allowed me to stay up a little bit extra to see what he was watching. And that's how I was first exposed to professional wrestling. Now, I didn't know it at the time, but I was about to watch some of the worst professional wrestling ever conducted. The dark day to professional wrestling. We were entering the PG era of world wrestling entertainment. Now, I did not know about the time, then little old me did not know. What I did know was I was seeing a lot of cool imagery, people doing crazy stunts, uh, ridiculous drama on stage, ways I had never seen done before, and I was hooked. Uh, at a very young age, some of my favorite wrestlers were uh, people like Shawn Michaels, Edge. Those are come the names that come to mind. The You made the Iron Sheik. <sighs> Man. The internet is empty without Mr. Sheik. Him and his tweets ranting about Hulk Hogan, lest we forget. <laughs> uh, so that's how the, the rest and I was introduced to. The first WrestleMania I watched live is considered the worst WrestleMania of all time, WrestleMania 27. Again, I was oblivious. I was a little kid. I didn't know better. This was all I knew about pro wrestling. So I was, I was happy. I was excited. I knew was, some things were boring about WrestleMania 27. The only thing I knew I liked, which I think surprised my father, I wasn't into John Cena because that was when John, this was peak Cena. I was into the Undertaker and Triple H match. And I, to this day, I don't, I will fight anybody. The two 21 11 hype packages are the stuff of legend. I did not know who Undertaker was until that day. I just kept seeing these images, and my dad was trying to explain to me, like, well, you know, there, there's this very big wrestler. His name's The Undertaker. You know, he's the Phenom. You know, you don't mess with The Undertaker, and he's coming back. Okay. You know, and this guy comes out, and it's, it's, it's ridiculous talking about it out loud. You know, The Undertaker, he's dressed, his originally, his gimmick was a literal Undertaker. You know, he had the gloves, the, the morbid attire. Then he had a weird biking biker phase. I like the biker phase. He plays Kid Rock. It's great. But then he went back to being The Undertaker. But he was more like, like a, an outlaw, a gunslinger now than he was like a straightforward dead man. So he comes back on February 21st, 2011. I think it was supposed to originally supposed to be Sting that was supposed to debut, but the plans didn't work out. But the thing I remember most about that night was not Undertaker returning, but Triple H's entrance. 
because I did not know who Triple H was. You know, my dad's hyped up for days, you know, who Undertaker is and Triple H music kids, Motorhead's playing. We go from this, you know, morbid orchestral music to rock music. And you have to understand, you know, my family, I grew up with like 70s and 80s rock. So I'm like, oh, okay, this is music I like. This is my cup of tea. And this guy's coming out, looks like the ultimate badass. So I was hooked from there. And I was a Triple H fan, which is very controversial now I know. Because <laughs> I, well, leave me, I know all about the whole politics. And we're going to get into that, the backstage drama with Paul Levesque. But I was a Triple H fan. I was hooked. These guys are the badasses. And then my father was trying to inform me around April, May of that year. Like, well, you know, these guys had like all these years of wrestling. You know, they don't really wrestle anymore. They'll only come around once or twice a year. And I'm like, well, that sucks. I don't like this stuff. I want to go see Triple H. That's the stuff I want to see. Fortunately, my father is like, well, you know, we can buy you DVDs of the older stuff so you know what they were. And remember, I'm a historian. I absorb anything from the past. That included wrestling. And then through the years, I would follow uh, WWE as much as I could. But I would also be acquiring wrestling DVDs to watch everything. With the exception of 35 and 39, no, 35 and 40. I've not yet seen this year's WrestleMania. I have seen every WrestleMania with the exception of 35 the whole way through. I have watched all the originals that were available to me. I remember getting through the DVD Netflix, the WrestleMania anthology one for 20, getting a disc at a time. I sat through it all. Guys, I know you love 80s and 90s. I know people even love the Attitude Era when wrestling was at its most popular, you know, you're getting like six figure, you know, you ever get like, you're almost getting like 10,000 people to tune in or well, 10, uh, 10,000. Oh, that would not be the happy 10 million people tuning in to watch. There's a lot of bad stuff. Every era of wrestling I've noticed is throwing things at the wall and seeing what sticks, especially when wrestling is the most popular or the most urgent. Let's see if this will get us a view. Let's see if this will go on up us. So, there are good moments. Those moments stand the test of time. But to get to those good moments, there's a lot of bad you have to sift through. So when I say that, remember, the early WrestleManias were rough. They're not as you remembered it. I think like the first WrestleMania I was genuinely invested in. I, I did like the Randy Savage, Ricky Steamboat match. That was pretty awesome at WrestleMania 3. Um, WrestleMania four, I always enjoyed just because it was the tournament. So it was all building towards something, you know, crowning Randy Savage as the world heavyweight champion. You know, it was all building towards something that night. Uh, WrestleMania five, mega powers really didn't care about the mega powers exploding. Um, WrestleMania six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah. There's not a lot of, yeah, sorry. There's a lot of fluff to get through in the early WrestleManias. I mean, WrestleMania 10, thank God got Bret Hart versus Owen Hart. And then I got into like the, the, com the compilations of certain wrestlers. So Bret Hart, once I learned who Bret Hart was, I wanted everything Bret Hart related, even though he wasn't wrestling anymore. Didn't matter. I'm like, oh, I can buy his DVDs. I can still buy his merch. And do I, I don't think I have the, nah, I don't have the, the original Bret Hart set I own. I got to buy that again. Uh, but big Bret Hart, I was into a bit Bret Hart phase then. And now I kept watching more and more wrestling. Then the WWE Network came out. So then I had immediate access to all these archives, albeit they were edited. And also my father got me and when I was a little bit older, getting my teenage years, decided it was time to introduce me to ECW. Extreme Championship Wrestling. You know, he's like, okay, you're a little old enough now. You can handle the violence. Which I'm like, well, I'm a historian, Dad. You know, I I read books with photographs of dead soldiers for my life. You know, <laughs> I can handle this stuff. Okay, we're good. We're good. So you can watch ECW. And boy, then I became the biggest ECW mark you'd ever see. <laughs> Now imagine 15-year-old me, die-hard ECW fan, even though the comp I had never gone to an ECW show. The company had been gone since 2001. Didn't matter because I inhaled anything and everything I can get my hands on ECW. I have gone through, and I mean, this was early YouTube still, when people could post stuff on YouTube and not get copyright strike. So people were posting unedited hardcore TV, the weekly show for ECW. And if you do not know what ECW is, well, 
One day I'm going to already do a full video on the channel. ECW was the alternative to early and mid nineties wrestling when WWE, which was then WWF and their rival WCW were doing very cartoonish characters, flashy neon colors that had come out of the eighties and the eighties refused to die. ECW was the Nirvana to the, the hair metal. If that makes sense. ECW was the Nirvana. This was the alternate music. This was the alternate product. It was grungy. It was dirty, lowly lit in a bingo. Well, warehouse converted into a bingo hall that was used for wrestling shows. A thousand people. I'm sure the toilets didn't work. Probably there was sewage halfway over the building. Very unsanitary. Would not happen in 2024, Pennsylvania. It was awesome. At least the visual was awesome. Now, I'm going to state again, there is a lot of drama, a lot of bad politics behind the scenes when it comes to ECW. I acknowledge them. I don't care right now. I'm talking about what I saw with my own two eyes and got to enjoy as entertainment. So ECW was the stuff of legend to me. And that became like what I liked about wrestling. The reason I'm bringing all of this up, and I could be here all day, by the way, I am very proud that I, I've gotten... Tommy Dreamer, Shane Douglas, and Rhino so far to autograph this. And Shane Douglas requires me to remind you that Rhino does not know how to do signatures. As he signed this, I wasn't paying attention to him, signed it on the plastic instead of pulling the sleeve out and signing it. That's kind of my own fault. I didn't give him the sleeve to sign. It was the early days. I was getting autographs. So that's the story. And Shane Douglas, he was laughing about telling me. So I have to give that to you. Why is Shane Douglas significant? Because Shane Douglas is from Pittsburgh, so he's automatically great. <laughs> that, that's my logic there. Yins are here. So just to give you an idea that though I did not live through the Attitude Era, live through the peak of wrestling, once I got hooked on wrestling, since I'm a historian, I absorbed it all or as much as I could. So I have watched quite a bit of wrestling history and I've become fans of wrestlers that Sadly, are no longer alive, like R Rowdy Roddy Piper. Not my grandfather adored Rowdy Roddy Piper. <laughs> he, 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 that was his big wrestler. I don't think he liked him in the 80s when he was active, but once my grandfather realized a bit of the behind the scenes stories of Piper, that was it. Piper was it. You know, Piper is the most comedic wrestler to ever exist. To this day, his, his, he is, his stuff, his speaking segments are the stuff of legend. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's wrestling soap opera for men. I'll say it. You'll say it. Wait, they used Rob Van Dam in a Metroid Prime commercial? I mean, that's a good idea. I mean, I'm also a big Rob Van Dam fan. But since I'm exposed, I was being exposed to all the stuff that happened in the past, then I really started to sour on what I was currently seeing. And man, 2015 in particular was rough if you're a mainstream wrestling fan. That, that People always say the 2011 was bad. Yeah, Triple H versus Undertaker at least. 2015, oh my God. It was so crap. And then I started getting invested into the independent circuit because you know I'm like, well, ECW was an independent 90s. Surely there's companies today that are doing this on a small scale. And indeed there are. There are many. In fact, there's probably more wrestling companies now than there ever was historically. It's crazy. They're just very small. I went to my local independent company. It was Vicious Outcast Wrestling. Uh, the entity's still around, but they've been dormant for years. Vicious Outcast Wrestling is a perfect microcosm for what I feel happened when wrestling's done right and wrong. They would draw in about two to 300 people. It was hosted in like a recreational facility near my house. They were able to have family entertainment, but they provided a wide variety of wrestling content. You had your standard matches and they would experiment with some more extreme matches, a little more violent, a little more intense, but they sprinkled them out enough that it was like you would build these stories. And remember they, these independent shows, maybe they only do one month, one show a month. They would build these shows up over the months, these stories and then they would build up to maybe a violent match, like a ladder match or maybe a scaffold match. So they, you weren't overindulging on it. And you also kept your wrestlers safe that you weren't doing this every night. You know, It's not a good idea to throw people through panes of glass on one occasion. 
let alone every single night. And there are some companies out there that thrive in doing hardcore wrestling on a daily basis, ECW included. But after a while, you, you can't you can't live off that. So make sure less is more in wrestling. I have, and, and actually, I think in any product, less is always more. To quote the evil genius Paul Heyman, accentuate the positives, hide the negatives. That, that's a philosophy I think many people, many facets of businesses need to lean into. Unfortunately, Vicious Outcast Wrestling really got it a good. They really craved the taste of blood. They did more and more violent matches. And I can only guess what happened. They stopped being hosted in the recreational building that we all liked. They started being hosted in a abandoned theater. It was not a good setup, the theater, for a wrestling show. It was an interesting venue, but just because everything's on an angle, just not a good idea. They increased the violence. Pennsylvania got a very, very intense athletic committee. Thanks in large part to ECW. <laughs> Basically, us Pencil the Pennsylvanians of the 21st century, we can't have nice things because in football, well, the Steelers, you know, they force the NFL to change rules. In hockey, the Penguins force to change their rules. In wrestling, ECW force to change their rules. So we can't have nice things as Pennsylvanians in sports. Do you do you have do I have a PTSD from from 2005 2015 in WWE? Yeah. Like those eras, dude, I, I can't name it off the top of my head, but I remember just being vehemently miserable every week. And I was like, why am I tuning this in? And then I'm getting to a point. I'm getting to a point, I promise. So, you know, I'm tuning in, you know, WWE every week. It's um getting, you know, it's like, okay, this is bored. Okay. I'm going to see VOW when it's at its peak. Hey, these guys, you know, they're, they're doing good. This is fun wrestling. I'm having fun here. And this is on a tiny scale. What is this little independent company doing right that the big company is not doing right? What am I missing? And then, of course, I'm starting to buy subscriptions to see other independent companies because now the internet's really exploding. You can really now stream all the stuff. I'm tuning into stuff from Combat Zone Wrestling, the spiritual successor of ECW. They're a scary company. They do some scary stuff. Uh, I started tuning into uh, Pro Wrestling Gorilla out of California. There are a lot of cool guys out there. You may know their names of today. You know, Kevin Steen, Kenny Omega, the Young Bucks, you know, El Generico. I don't know what happened. El Generico was a great wrestler. You know, he, he was this a mass wrestler. He had, an, he had like a red beard. Very crazy on the ropes. You know, really cool. He had this great rivalry with Kevin Steen. But then he um he retired apparently and uh, went down to uh, save them starving children down in Mexico or down in Ecuador from what I was last told. And ever since then, there's been a guy with the same move step by the name of Sammy Zayn. But he's just, just not the same. That's an inside joke for those that know wrestling. <laughs> Anyways, so yeah, you know, I'm getting the point. The point I'm saying, like, why are all these smaller companies doing better and WWE is not doing good? And then we get into what I call the frustration era, which is like the late 2010s, where WWE is starting to hire all of these good wrestlers in the independent scene. And they're putting them in, you know, and they're Get put them in their developmental league known as NXT. And NXT was once the laughing stock of WWE because they would just place run it like a game show. Well, then Triple H and a team of his associates will say took over NXT and rebranded, like, no, this is a strict wrestling show, but for developmental talent. And then NXT started becoming the best product in pro wrestling. I kid you not. It's crazy to think because it was only like five, six years ago. NXT was selling out arenas when WWE would go to a city to do one of their four major pay-per-views. They would have a big NXT pay-per-view. That was the sellout. People were going to see that. That was where the best wrestling was. And it was the developmental. And guess what would happen? These guys would get developed by WWE. They would graduate to the main roster and they would do nothing with them. They usually would be cannon fodder for two or three big dudes like Roman Reigns or if Brock Lesnar was roaming around. 
And it's like, what the hell is happening? How how are you still making money, WWE? Oh, because NXT, everybody's tuning into the network to watch NXT, so then you can see all these great wrestlers can invest in them and then get crapped on in the main league. Kind of ticks you off, kind of upsets you. Did you invest your time and energy to cheer these people on, to care about these characters? Because let's be fair, these wrestlers are playing characters just to get them crapped on by people who don't know how to use them. Hey, Wrangler. People from Iron Age, does this sound familiar to you folks? About, you know, corporate individuals taking stuff you love and completely destroying it because they don't know how to use it? Hmm, wonder, it's, this is not an isolated incident in this, the world of storytelling. And then eventually, I just tuned out of WWE for a while. I was only watching, I was watching Japanese wrestling because it was the best. But then I heard, you know, hey, all these guys that I like from the independent scene that are over in Japan, they're going to make their own company, All Elite Wrestling. They're going to compete with WWE. Nobody's competed with WWE in 20 years, at least in the United States of America. They're getting primetime slots on Turner's, Turner Networks, on TNT and TBS. Holy crap. We have a chance because competition breeds innovation. When you're competing with somebody, even if it's friendly, and I do condone friendly competition, not violent competition, unless it's being staged in wrestling, competition will make you get creative. Hmm. How can I one up this person? Hmm. How can I stay on their league? Hmm. Let's do this. Let's see if this works. And this is where you get the throne at the wall and see what sticks. Not all of it's always great, but you know, do something, at least try, not just sit there and just expect that you're going to make money every day. Oh yeah. Well, we're the only company, you know, no, who, what are they going to do? Go make their own company. So AEW was born in 2019 and you know what? That's what I watched through the pan. Well, as best I could for the pandemic, watching wrestling for the pandemic was rough, which is why I didn't watch. Okay. WrestleMania 36. I didn't watch either because I refuse to watch that. I just can't watch that in an empty arena. Just can't. Wrestling's not the same without a crowd. I watched AEW. I was full on AEW. The greatest t-shirt company ever. Got several shirts. And you keep seeing WWE. You feel it. You can feel it in the air. Like you got all the right talent. On and off screen. But you refuse to put the pieces together. It's so infuriating. So we're in the infuriating area. Era. And then. It happened. Just last year, WWE was sold by the McMahon family to the same enterprise that owns UFC. And they made a super entity known, I mean, was it called like, is it Endeavor Sports or is it TKO Sports? It's one or two. They have like a certain name. I don't even know. I don't think anybody knows it. What we know is that there's a conglomerate that now owns UFC and WWE. That should be worst case scenario in theory. You know, typically how much I loathe family businesses being bought out and just turned into corporations. I loathe it. The problem is, and this is what makes the situation unique, WWE has been complete crap in the ratings and in creativity for decades. As the McMahon family still ran it. Because somebody who was still in the driver's chair was completely out of touch. And there's one thing about corporations, they like to make money. They like to make their shareholders happy. And while WWE did have their shareholders with the McMahon family, there still was that umbrella. They had all their other investments, so they didn't really have to worry about the actual wrestling product. Well, now that we have UFC, you know, one of the most dominant sport leagues in North America at the, at the moment, the same people are now in league with WWE. <laughs> Things were told to change. Now, I have been told so many times by, you know, WWE, oh, this is the new era. They said it like every six months there in like the late 2010. This is the new era. We're going to change things. And you'd get like a week or two of something good and then it goes nowhere. We would just default back to Brock Lesnar or later Roman Reigns. So I'm still, and I'm still right now, April, 2024, gun shy. I'm like, yeah, new era. Okay. Prove it to me. Prove to me that you've actually changed. So I will invest. And I've been burned so long that it's going to take many, many months. And actually last year's WrestleMania, I had enough. I 
I'm like, okay, you got Cody Rhodes, the one of the founders of AEW, mind the way, who's come back over to WWE. You know, he's going to challenge for the WWE Championship. This is this guy's white hot right now. You put him on the belt, should put the belt on him. You know, everybody wants to cheer for him. It's rare to get some. I think it's harder to get somebody to cheer for you than it is to get somebody to boo for you in wrestling, honestly. Like, at least cheer in the right sense. Because so much now in WWE, the bad guys get cheered because they're actually interesting. Crowd's like, oh my God, something interesting. Yay, yay, I'm going to cheer you because the, 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 the good guys are boring as all hell. We don't, Or we don't like them. Like when Roman Reigns, they try to make him a good guy and that was a nightmare. Well, they did not give Cody Rhodes the title of WrestleMania 39. I could say now, a year later, it did work out because Cody Rhodes won the WWE Championship this year at WrestleMania. Interestingly, in Philadelphia. Everybody said good things about WrestleMania 40. I didn't see it. I've been so burned that I, I can't, I just can't commit. It will take a, a lot. You'll have to move major boulders, WWE, to get me to reinvest. Oh, you say you changed? Oh, you got new owners? Prove it to me. Prove that you actually care about making a creative product. But in any case, there is this new opportunity that, hey, new owners are in. We want to make cold, hard cash. Fans want to buy this stuff. They want to share for that guy. Let's make that guy. Let's push that guy. Fans want to talk. You know, money talks. The truth is money talks in this world. Now. AEW, who I was enjoying, and I'm like, yeah, they're sticking to the man. You know, we're, we're rebelling. You know, this is, this is the new era. You know, the new rebellion. Like, we had ECW in the 90s. Now we got AEW in the 2020s. Yeah, let's go. Well, w, AEW is in a very bad situation right now. And this is where, why I'm talking about this on all of this on Uncut History. All these lessons that can be learned by anybody trying to tell a story. How to, you know, you should, probably should make the fans happy. AW often will say, well, we're a wrestling company founded by wrestlers for wrestlers. You know, this is an area where opportunities are open to everybody. You know, we're all ears. And if you have something that works, good. You know. We want to cooperate, collaborate behind the scenes. You know, this is a safe atmosphere to be in. This is not a dictatorship. You live long enough to, either, to, to freaking quote a character from the Dark Knight. You either die a hero or live long enough to see yourself become the villain. Initially, things were very wild in AW. Not just like, oh, this is cool stuff happening. I mean, literally every week they would end the episode for brawl. And I think I ranted about nine episodes into one of my coworkers. I'm like, every episode ends in a brawl. I was told, well, they have to get everybody over. Everybody, you know, they got a new roster. We're the ninth week in. Can we show some order on this show? Can I believe that there are rules that are being followed <laughs> at the very least? So I can believe in the wrestling that I'm seeing. Well, one of the biggest things was a few years ago, AW signed CM Punk. And CM Punk is one of the most top big names in wrestling because of controversy. Because CM Punk was wronged by WWE in the early 2010s, so he walked away. And everybody wanted him to come back, to speak his mind, to wrestle, all that. AW in 2021 were able to entice CM Punk to come out of retirement. They made a whole deal about it, hosting this whole sh show in a very expensive venue in Chicago, his hometown, the rent that places wrestling shows don't often host in. He came out, biggest crowd reaction I've ever heard in wrestling. Still go see that. It, it, it the level of noise Chicago made at night. I and I knew it was gonna be loud, but not that loud. He was having matches. We were having fun stories, and then things started falling apart. He got injured not once, but twice, both times when he won the world championship. And things were said behind the scenes that made people uncomfortable and made them be become paranoid that something was happening. And the owner of the company did not put a squash on these rumors and not try to ease the tension or try to lay the law down like, guys, I know you have personal squabbles keep them outside of our locker rooms. You know, we can deal the situation like gentlemen. Instead, people like CM Punk 
got into a lot of arguments behind the scenes. Now, if this stuff happened 20 years ago, we want to hear about it. There is a double-edged sword with us being so interconnected by the internet. It's great now that we can instantly communicate with each other ideas, thoughts, expressions that could revolutionize the world. It also puts a very, you know, strict surveillance on, you know, businesses and entities like you better treat you people well, because if we find out you're not, it's very easy to find you out. and It's very easy to shut you down as well. The drawback of that also is now you get to see all the ugly side of everybody in the world. Stuff that people would keep bottled in normally. You know, like me and my rant about civil war. <laughs> uh, it's let out in full droves because a lot of people think, well, it's the internet. There's nothing. There's, there's, it's, it's fake. That's BS, by the way. You know, treat the internet. If you're going to speak about something on the internet, you treat it like you're talking to a person in public and that this is going to be something you're going to be scrutinized with for the rest of your life. That's how the internet works today, sadly. Well, with wrestling, so much backstage drama has come to light over the years. More and more. It's every little thing everybody throws a hissy fit over, be it wrestling fans, uh, the the production team, or the talent themselves. CM Punk's just one example. He's not alone in this. But yeah, these very sensitive people who are now hypersensitive because they have the internet on them, and now we get to hear every thought and they have going in and out of their brains. Not necessarily a fun thing. It's like, okay, did I really need to know that? Did I know that you really didn't like this guy? Did he have an argument that you called, you know, this gentleman out? I, I don't really care. Just, just, inter just put on a good show. That's all I ask. Keep, keep the politics out of the locker room. Well, on two occasions, CM Punk found himself in the middle of a backstage brawl. First, with the executive vice presidents of AEW, who are also wrestlers, and then he found him, and he got into a confrontation with a wrestler by the name of Jack Perry. This last one occurred uh, several months ago. And as a result of that, CM Punk was either fired or he quit AEW. It's still just everybody claims something different. So that happened. That was a very black mark for AW. It's like really made you question like, hey, if I just was supposed to be rest a wrestling company for wrestlers and now one of the top wrestlers just walked out and said you're all unprofessional. How did this guy saying he was loving the coming here, was excited to be here in two years, it turned to I hate this company and I need to be out of here now. And not only that, that the man who said he would never go back to WWE just like two months after he left AW signs with WWE where he is right now. What is the hell is going on with AW backstage? How petty are these people? Did the internet just make them all crazy? Actually, I think yes. I think it made everybody crazy in the world. And here we are. Yesterday, AW had an episode, and lately they've not been doing good in the ratings. Cody Rhodes left, one of their founders. He's back in WWE. CM Punk, their top star, left to go back to WWE. You're hearing all this drama about every show's being chaotic. They're like writing this stuff the day before they go live type deal. And then they decide to release security footage, honest to God security footage of that fight I just described on live TV to try to push a storyline that has nothing to do with a wrestler that's left the company. That reeks of desperation for a rating. That is low. That's just like scummy to do. Why would you do that? I don't trust this company. They're a bunch of immature brats right now. Which is the same thing I felt with WWE to an extent. I'm like, this company's being run. When, when I let down WWE, I'm like, this company is being run into the ground. Everything I hear about, I'm tired of the drama. I'm reading about every day happening behind the scenes. I don't want to watch this product. I'm sick. Now I hear the same thing about AEW. I actually haven't watched AEW since these, since the second fight with CM Punk because I you know I had nothing to do with that. Well, CM Punk's on TV. I'm not going to watch. No, it was just more the guys. This happened once. You should have solved it. You didn't solve the problem. I can't trust you to put on a good product. I'm turning off. You're looking like WCW which 20 years ago ran itself in the ground because leadership lost the plot and let egos prevail. 
You're not learning from history. You're not learning from the mistakes of the past. You should have improved upon the mistakes previous rivals of WWE made. Not just repeat them. So I can't go watch WWE because I've been burned so many times that I can't trust going near that place to watch wrestling. And now I can't watch AW because they put all their drama out for everybody to see. Everybody's so immature in the inner in the wrestling field, in the entertainment field. Can't you guys just keep a lid on your mouth sometimes? Jeez. So yeah, that's my rant about wrestling. I know it really doesn't have nothing to do with history, but I feel it does show how frustrating it can be when people don't learn from the mistakes of their past. When these other companies have well documented, have these all these documentaries, all of this press releases, everybody talking about how crappy it was in the final days of places like WCW and ECW. And you don't learn from those mistakes. That's what infuriates me. All right, let me go for the chat. <laughs> so a little bit about when he found uh, met the Sheik at a TV shop I worked at in ninety or ninety one. Cool. If they want to step it up, then he'll probably try to simulate superpowers. They sort of already did that with Tajiri. Yeah, there's a lot of wrestlers that did the the, the miss. Uh, the great Muda, who recently retired, he did the miss as well. So, yeah. And I also think, for those that are watching, uh, know me from being involved with, like, you know, what, you know, I'm a big follower of independent creators, you know. Just because I love history to death doesn't mean I always read a history book. You know, sometimes I want to, from time to time, well, I have a history book up here. You know, sometimes I have this whole nice library down here of fiction books. Uh, let's just grab one right here. I yeah, yeah, I can't reach it so far. Yeah. One I'm going to read, Haley Star Bad Kitty. By the way, the offer's in the chat. No, I did not pick this one because the offer's in the chat. I'm just like, this is the one I can reach. It's easy. Uh, Haley Star Bad Kitty by Ethan. So support us. Come on, I've not glitched too many times tonight. Give me some slack. You know, I want to get into this one day. A little bit about the background on it. On a potato farm in a rural Connecticut town lives an empathetic girl named Haley Starr and her father, Harry. The day after her 10th birthday and before Halloween is when they came. They came? Like, they live? Roddy Piper? They live? Invaders from another reality captured most of the townspeople and replaced them with strange copies. Haley narrowly escaped and her day became stranger still when she encountered the Egyptian goddess Bastet. Haley learns that Bastet knows how to use her own mystical energy to protect herself from the invaders. But she soon enters an underground facility beneath the town to find herself in a world of mysticism and strange technologies. Now Haley with her friend Elizabeth and the help of some U.S. Marshals must learn about the larger nature of her reality. The girls must wisely use their energetic abilities to stay alive. But more importantly, they must learn to understand themselves in order to handle the challenges ahead. That sounds like a lot of fun. That sounds like some escapism from life. You know, oh, I want to entertain myself. Because believe me, guys, when I do research, there are moments where I just go, my God, this is so depressing. Why are we living in the world? Hey, look, something fun. Look, there's a cat on there, you know, potato gun. Sometimes you just need to escape for a bit. Unfortunately, a lot of the people that for years we entrusted to give us escapism you know, to produce all these great stories and characters to live by. And for some people, those were people they idolize, even though they're fictional. You know, those are good life lessons some of these stories trusted us with. Now it's the same crap over and over and over. They just rinse and repeat and they get away with it too. Like WWE did for many years. The same bad wrestling, never and the storylines that went nowhere. They kept they kept doing it with no punishment. They kept doing it. And AEW now, with all this you know, squabble, well, I don't like this, well, I don't like that, so I'm not going to work with that guy because I didn't like that guy's dinner or some crap like that. These personal petty squabbles or maybe even political squabbles. They can't put their differences aside to put out a good product, and they air it all for everybody to hear. And it's like, God, these people have millions of dollars, and I get to, and also they can just rant about their lives. I don't have time for that. You know, if I'm going to, I'm going to spend my hard earned money on something that entertains me. 
like Haley Star's Bad Kitty, or maybe something like a new animated project made by animators who just want to tell a good story. Something like, I know there's Lack of Daisy that's coming out. Uh, the Amazing Digital Circus, this fascinating, I can only describe as, you know, you know, abyssal horror, you know, it's seemingly funny, but, you know, there's this deep layers of, oh, we're all trapped in a video game. All these guys stuck in like a 90s video game. <laughs> The horrors of that. You know, that's going to be a great series coming out. All this stuff does not need the corporations. It does not need the power elite to approve it. All I need is to say, you want to make a product? Uh, let's get us all together. I'll fund that. You know, here, here's some money. You know, I'm willing to buy that. I, I don't care if it's in a limited format. As long as it's good. That's all I matter. If you're good at something and you can accentuate your positive and hide your negative, we're all good. That's what I want. Less is more sometimes. Less is more. And I think you're going to see that more and more. Uh, you can argue, you know, it used to be history only came from, you know, you only got it from these certain scholars and it was very limited. And it was because communication moved much more restricted back then to really release like a historical finding. I mean, you, you had these high ranking scholars, they were the historians, it was their way or the highway deal. And that's kind of how you get a lot of these mythologies over the years like the lost cause movement why they became so entrenched in parts of the united states and other parts of the world these myths it's like that isn't true well you know we're not rewriting the textbooks we're, we're, we're good at telling a story we're not willing to change it but now you have people challenging history it's like but i found this other evidence that says otherwise now you're being more open now everybody can anybody can really get involved with telling history you know as long as you do you go out there seek out research and say hey according to this source it states this it conflicts with that whether we already know anybody can put in the hard work to research and tell our shared past to tell these stories anybody can do it re realistically uh people will keep saying that oh only the upper echelons can tell stories because they're the ones that have all the means to all these resources. Well, those resources are becoming more and more available to the lower echelons of society. And I can't wait to see what creativity goes wild in all fields. My history field and people telling fictional stories now that they have the tools and the means to produce to produce stuff that people want. You know, that people do want to hear. There are people out there that may want to listen to an obscure story about some marine maneuvers at Gettysburg. I never knew that before. Currently, if you go to Gettysburg, there's one wayside marker about it. You're not going to hear much about it. But somebody published a book about it, which me and my friends got a hold of. And we're like, we got to tell the story for the general public. Let's spread that out. But that's just an example of how, you know, hey, those resources are becoming increasingly more available to tell these stories, both real and fictional. Jump onto that. You know, take advantage of it now. Fair enough. Less is more until you open your wallet. That is true. But I, I still think things being more, if you find the core thing that you like and you can focus on that and it's like, I can't really afford this, this and that, but I can really do this element and I'm going to try really good to hype that up. It can take you a distance. It may then like, hey, we like what you're able to do in here. We might contribute some funds to you. Oh, now I got a little more funding so I can do a little more now. You know, it kind of grows from there. Or I'm completely brainwashed into the American dream and I have this, you know, futile hope that it still survives in some capacity. All right. I've ran it for an hour and a half. I think I'm going to go to sleep now. I've, I've woken everybody up and I see here comes Fred. You can't see him. He's, he's not on camera, but he's right down here. you know, the, the silent cat that tends, he's the one you usually see pop up behind me. If I'm doing videos up, oh, you can see a shadow. Yeah. Yep. All right. Well guys, we are winding down for the evening. Thank you all for watching. Uh, before you do the part, if you could do one thing for me, if you want to hit the like button down below, it does let the algorithms know. And I know I keep harping this on and it's like, oh, it's all part of the, the spiel to sell the channel. It does legit help let this channel grow. Uh, simple like out, simple like liking, the more likes goes into this database somewhere in the tube you realms that, you know, it's like, oh, people like this video. Let's promote this video more, which that means then people have more, they'll be more easily accessible to see the main content here on the channel and get to learn more about our shared past. They will get to become educated on historical events that 
you're not going to find in the history textbooks. So be sure to hit the like button before you depart. Thank you for tuning in, Ghost of Howard's Right Arm. And thank you for tuning in, Wrangler, and everybody else who's tuned in. And we will see you next time in Uncut History. I'm in college mode, so I don't know quite when that'll happen. Maybe next Thursday, maybe the Thursday after. We will see. Uh, the only thing that's sure about Readout Productions is that nothing is for sure. Thank you guys for tuning in. Traitors up with the stars We will reel around the flag Boys and relay once again Shouting the battle cry of free